So there is a war. There's a war for your soul and mine. And the first lie that the evil one, the schemer, tells you, for many of you right now are saying to yourself, there's no war. I just need another stimulus check. (laughs) There's no war. I just need to have better self-esteem. There's no war. I just need to finish the degree. There's no war. My boss is just a jerk. There's no war. My neighbor gives my boss a run for his money. There's no war. My wife's just not taking care of me. My husband's not taking care of me. There's no war. Oh, yeah, there's a war. There's a war that goes to the heart of your soul and mine. And there is a schemer who knows where to set the hook in you. So today we want to talk about something, and I I don't walk lightly into this subject. I told our staff this week, I said, be prepared for death by a thousand cuts this week with lots of distractions and lots of stuff like that because this week we're going to talk about how we are able to do war by the power of God in our lives. I begin, first of all, by, by sharing you, sharing with you, rather, something that I, I came across this week from the writings of David Jeremiah. So I want to make sure to give proper credit. But, but I want to make sure that you understand that I personalized this toward me because what he wrote is exactly where the devil will hit me. And here's what Jeremiah writes. If you could sneak into Satan's office, wherever that might be, he's not in hell yet. And take a peek into his files. You might be surprised to find a little file folder with your name on it. I'm not exaggerating. He keeps a file on you. And inside that file are all the strategies, including a bad microphone connection. That's me, not them back there. He keeps a file on you inside that file. And all the strategies he's tried on you. The ones that have worked and the ones that have failed. Amen. I like that. (laughs) He doesn't waste strategies that have caused you to stumble in the past. As long as they keep working, he keeps using them. Do you know what his method is? Somewhere in the file cabinet, there's a file labeled Hardy Ray. In this file, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there was a notation that reads something like this. Subject may be prone to discouragement, especially if he becomes overly weary. Suggestion, make sure he stays busy, overcommitted, and physically tired. At all times, keep him from extended times of of reading the Bible and praying to the enemy. So what's Satan's strategy for me? He looks for ways to discourage me and, if possible, cause me some depression. This is true for Jeremiah. It's true for Hardy. He will use whatever people, means, or circumstances it takes to achieve his goal. It's the same for you. Maybe your file says, frequently tempted to gossip, or quick temper, or prone to coveting and jealousy, or weak in the area of lust. Don't kid yourself. The God that loves you has a wonderful plan for your life. That's very good news. But it's also true that Satan hates you and has a plan and a strategy to destroy your walk with Jesus Christ or to never get you to start. The one, that's one big reason why you experience struggle and discouragement if you are a Christ follower. Sometimes I hear people say, well, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't have any struggles. You shouldn't ever feel discouraged. All is peace and joy and love and happiness. I don't think so. I personally know so. I personally think that description fits better with life before you found salvation in Christ. You know why? Jeremiah writes. Because you only had one influence in your life at that time. There was no contest. There was no battle for your heart. There was no tug of war for your soul. But there always has been, and there always will be. So who's going to win the fight for the battle of your life? Today I'm praying that all of you that are here, present, here online, here on the patios, if you're liking getting wet out there today, 
But you'll have made this decision and made sure that on this October the 25th, 2020, between 930 and 1030, that you will say, I have crossed over from death to life. I'm fighting on the right team right now. And if you are a Christ follower, and if you have felt oppressed, and like the evil one is trying to kill you with death by a thousand cuts, guess what? You're not alone. Put on the full armor of God, the scripture says, so that you might be able to stand against the devil's schemes. Here's why. He is a schemer. Now let me ask you a question. Fathers out there. How many of you are fathers? You have beautiful daughters, if you would. If you have sons, this doesn't apply as much because they tend to be the schemers. But anyway. I'm just kidding. I'm, I resemble that remark. I'm mostly testosterone myself. Suppose somebody came up to you and said, hey, listen, I want to take your daughter out. And I've got a method that I use on girls. I've got a strategy. I've got some tricks. If you didn't kick him in the teeth and push him out of your face and say, Get away from my daughter, you would not be a good father. Let me ask you this question. Somebody came to you and says, listen, hey, listen, I got this method. I've got this scheme. I've got this way that I can hoodoo people. You want to join me? Let's just make it simple. The word for schemes of the devil is the word methodia in the Greek language. He's got a method. Get this. It's not just a blanket method. It is very personal, and it is unique to you, and it is unique to me, and unique to all of us. Here's several different ways that the evil one can attack us, at least theoretically. The first device that he uses is this one, to present the bait, but to hide the hook. It looks really good until you bite into it. And then there's blood in the water. Number two, by painting sin with virtue's colors. Oh, but look how beautiful sex outside of marriage is. Oh, but, but look how fantastic it would be if you could get greedy enough to buy that thing and you did everything in your power to manipulate people so you'd have enough money. And how beautiful that is. Oh. But they're so charismatic. They're so wonderful. Why would you not want to follow them? Two, device number two. Excuse me, by device number three. By extenuating and lessening of sin. <laughs> by, by saying, listen, hey, listen, there's extenuating circumstances. There's reasons that I have to do this. Uh, this need's not taken care of in my life over here. So I have to do it this way because, you know, I just got to have my needs and my needs have to get met. Device number four. By presenting to your soul the best of men's sins, the adultery of David, the pride of Hezekiah the king, amen, that's right, the impatience of Job, the drunkenness of Noah, the blasphemy of Peter. So, so here's what he does. He said, but you see, look, there's David, there's Hezekiah, there's Jeremiah, there's Peter, there, there, there's Job. Look at them. They're some of the best people. But if you and I could hear the groans and the cries and the despair that came out of all of their lives because of their sin and how God puts it in the Bible. By, by the way, one of the ways you know that Christianity is true is that other faiths don't put their, their heroes with such truisms and such true descriptions. Some of the greatest people have sinned, but you could ask every single one of them how awful it was after the sin was committed. Ask David after his adultery with Bathsheba what it felt like to have his baby die. To have his wife come in and become controlling because she controlled him on top of the roof. She's going to control him through the rest of his life. Ask him what it was like to have all the people in his kingdom lose respect for him. Ask him what it's like in the long term when even his son turned against him and ended up being killed by his commander, his right-hand man, because his son rebelled against him. Ask David if his sin was wonderful. Device number five, to present God to the soul as one made up of all mercy. Hey, let me tell you something, y'all. God is a God of grace, and God is a God of mercy, but everything does not go with God. 
Some of you go into your sin with a ticket saying, God's going to give me grace and mercy to get me out of it. Isn't that the good news of the gospel, by the way? Can I just do whatever I want to do? I'm just going to make up my mind. And, and hallelujah, you got my ticket to heaven. Now I'm going to live like hell. Device number six, by persuading your soul that the work of repentance is easy. All you got to do is do this and turn your walk in that way. And that therefore the soul does not need to make such a matter of sin. In other words, hey, if I do sin, I can just go and say, oh, I'm sorry I did that again, but I'm looking forward to next Thursday. <laughs> Device number eight, by showing how God is merciful to vain people and without punishment. One of the greatest things in your life that tempts you is that, yeah, but look at those people. They say this and they do that and they're rich and they have all the pleasure they want, and they have all the stuff they want, and they're as famous as they want to be. What about them? Gosh, it doesn't pay to be a Christian. <laughs> yeah, well, they're not home yet. And all payments are not settled. I told you this story before, but many of you might be new, that there was a church in the Midwest that was constantly beseeched by a guy that was a farmer that plowed his fields around the church, and he chose to do it on Sunday morning. He chose to plow and make all the noise he could. And in the fall in October, when it was time for the harvest to take place, the farmer wrote a letter to the editor in the newspaper. He said, there is no God. I'm an atheist, and I've never believed in God. I surround that church with my land, and I've made noise all during the summer and the fall as they've tried to worship, and I have the best crop I've had ever. The pastor of the church wrote back a very simple op-ed in the newspaper in regards to the gentleman who talked about making all the noise around our church. God does not settle all of his accounts in October. Device number nine. He uses it by saying God's holding out on you. Stop being good. God's holding out on you. He, he's not going to allow you to be able to to do the things that you need. He's holding out on you. That's what he said to Eve in the garden. You're not going to die. Just eat it. God, God knows that if you do this, then you're going to be smart as he is. God's holding out on you. you. Have you heard that voice before? Come on, take a bite. Device number 10. By getting you to compare yourself with the worst people that there are in the world. Well, I don't do this, but I'm not as bad as them. I don't do this, I'm not as bad as those people. I'm not, I'm, I'm not perfect, but da, da, da. That's, a, that's a pretty low standard, isn't it? Number 11, by telling you to hang loose with pollution and dilution. Just hang loose. I'm not talking about stuff you put in the water and in the environment and the air, and I care about all this stuff as much as any of you do. Talk about the stuff you put in your mind. Stuff you eyes see through the window of the screens that you watch. Through the advice of, you know what? I know you're not supposed to do this, but if you do this with your money, then you could do that, and then everything would be okay. And see, pollution is bad. Dilution is just as bad. One boy was watching movies he wasn't supposed to be watching. Mom caught him doing it. She said, you're not supposed to do this. She said, well, it's just a little bit. I'm mostly good. Most, I go to youth on Wednesday nights and um, thinking about being baptized in a couple of weeks and all this kind of stuff. But it's just, it's just a little bit of bad, and don't, don't worry about it. By the way, for all you people that like to watch Halloween and scary movies, I want to be like the guy on the Geico commercial that's going like, I can't believe y'all are watching this stuff. It freaks me out. Mother went home, and she, she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something for you. When you come home from school today, I'm going to have it ready. She made a, a pan of brownies. She had the brownies ready. He said, thanks, Mom. And she said, she, she dished out a couple, gave a glass of milk. She said, I just want to let you know one thing, that, that I took a little bit of Fido's poop, and I mixed it in there. And it's all in there, just a little bit of it. Finally, device number 10. To choose company and to decide to keep company with people that are wicked most of the time. How then 
can we live? How then can we stand against the schemes, the methods, the dude with a manipulative plan for your life? First, decide to be strong and to do what's right and not wrong. D decide to be strong and do what's right and not what's wrong. The Apostle Paul is writing to a group of people like people here in Belmont and Mount Holly and Gastonia and Charlotte. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Say this with me. So that. So that. Say it again. So that. Babies help me. So that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. Second, focus on who you really struggle with. You struggle with the devil. He can't be everywhere all at once, but he does have his emissaries. He does have his demons. Steve Brown says, the dragon has been slain, but the, his tail still squishes. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is a war, and you and I know it. We need to teach our children about it. We need to prepare them to deal with it. We need to teach our, ourselves and others not to flirt with it, but to put all of God's protective armor on our lives. See, put God's armor on, not your own, and stand your ground. Put God's armor on, not your own, to stand your ground. Let me just tell you something. You are in the most trouble ever when you decide I got this. I can handle my, my temptation. I can handle my lust. I can handle my deviousness that's going through my mind to do this or to select that or whatever. I can handle it. I'm tough. I'm a man. I'm a woman. I'm strong. Listen, you, nobody struts into the kingdom of God. Don't try to strut against the devil. By the way, don't you call out the devil without using Jesus' name first. Because the dragon has been slain, but his tail still does swish. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. In a particularly difficult season in the life of our church, one of our leaders like Anthony said, you know what, this has been a hard time uh, years and years ago. He said, but here's what I've decided to do. I've just decided to stand. I'm going to stand right here. I'm going to hold this thing that God has given to us called his local church. And I'm going to help and come alongside you, Pastor, to help make sure that, that your arms are strong and the people that work around you are strong and that you're going to be able to stand your ground. you got to decide, though, consciously to put your armor on. Next, stand firm and don't get loose. Stand firm and don't get loose. How many of you are NASCAR fans or Indy 500 fans or race car fans or whatever? So, so one of the worst things that can happen to a car is if a car is going around the curve and the back end gets a little loose, it can make the car spin out or go up against the wall. You know what? You can be going at such a high speed in life that your front and your back ends get loose. <laughs> and you hit the wall and you wonder, where in the world did that come from? Because you've got to be paying attention to everything in your life. So how then do you stand firm? How then do, do I stand firm? How, how can we stand firm? He gets very specific. First of all, he says, with the belt of truth around your waist. He's saying in order for you to understand what you need to do next, you need to understand that there is a truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Everybody say way. way. Truth. truth. Life. life. Jesus is about all three. He said, I'm the way to go. I am the truth. I am the life. He doesn't say a way. I am a truth. I am a life. Your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. He said, no, this, I'm, I'm it. I'm, I'm the truth. So he says, buckle the belt around your waist. It's the first thing he's talking about. Here's why. Because it all begins and ends with, with what is true. Years ago, Shirley MacLaine, who wrote, Braced by the light and numerous other doo -doo 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 kind of craziness books and that kind of stuff. She would talk about going out to the beach and throwing her arms in Malibu and throwing her arms up and going, saying, I'm God. 
I am God. I am God. I can just see God up in heaven saying, hey, Peter, Noah, James, come look at this. He thinks he's God. Sometimes somebody says to you, you don't really believe that, do you? It's, oh, yeah. I, I believe in the truth. Because how can you know what is true unless you know what the truth is? And how can you know what the truth is unless there is a truth that you can know? There is a truth. Hey, let me talk to the, the generation we have now and to your adult parents and that kind of stuff. You think because you got the screens and you got Google, you've got the truth? Huh. God says about his word, this word is truth. And everything you do and every lever you pull and every selection you make and everything that you and I do must be filtered through this. Not just here, but here. It begins in your heart. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, but also with the breastplate of righteousness in place. The breastplate of righteousness was like a football player's pads, except it went all the way down. And it protected the heart, the lungs, the internal organs. We don't like to think about having a diaphragm, or we don't like to think about having a stomach or a colon or a lower intestine or upper intestine until we don't have one. Put the breastplate of righteousness on you. More often than not, every week, as a matter of fact, every week I do it at one time or another, kneeling before I come on the stage to talk to you, I say, Dear God, if there are any smudges on my breastplate of righteousness, would you please wipe them off? Because I don't want the people here to see anything that's diluted or polluted by my sin. Stand firm also with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In another translation, let your shoes be shorn with the gospel of peace. A couple of Christmases ago, I used this illustration. The, the Roman soldier had spikes that looked like a track man spikes or the spikes of a football player who's going to need good traction today when the Carolina Panthers defeat the New Orleans Saints. They're going to need traction, so they got cleats on with spikes. And so he's saying, you need to put your spikes on so you can stand firm against the schemer because he's going to try to knock you over. He's going to try to knock you out of bounds. He's going to try to make you slip. So, so put the shoes of the gospel of peace. Let me just tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I have, I have tried. I have explored. I have studied the world religions at the finest institutions in the world. There is nothing like Jesus. There is nothing like Christianity. There is nothing like being able to say, I follow Jesus and take my next steps on my journey with him. But he says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. He says, you got the belt of truth around you. You're standing in the shoes of the gospel of peace. you got your breastplate of righteousness on. He's like, make sure before you do anything else to go out with those three things. Then he says, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You, you pick it up. A, a Roman soldier would pick up his spear and, and when, or his, his, his shield so that when spears and points of the sword would come, he could go, and he could block those things. Let me tell you something. Sometimes because you're facing somebody, you're not going to make it the next week because you don't have enough money to bank. <laughs> Caught it. You're not going to be able to be faithful to your spouse while you're on this business trip. <laughs> Caught it. You're not going to be able to, to, to make it through another day. <laughs> Caught that sign of discouragement. You're not going to be able to do this. <laughs> Caught it. You're not going to be able to do that. Take the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Then take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, several years ago when I was in college, Jonathan Scott is a pastor at um, Forest Hills Church in the South Park area. I heard Jonathan preach um, at a, a revival thing that he did. I went here. I'll never forget what he said. He said, always make sure that you've got the helmet of salvation on your head. Because the devil's a little guy, and he's always whispering in your ear. And the helmet of salvation has coverings that cover your ears. Have you professed faith in Jesus Christ today? Have you already done so? Praise God if you have. 
If you have already done so, have you taken the next step as an adult, as a teenager, as a seasoned adult to say, I want to identify with Jesus the way that Jesus did? The first step Jesus did when he went public with his ministry, he went to be baptized. Not because he was a sinner that needed to show that we were, he was in need of repentance, but to show us to be that example. How many of you out there have yet again heard an appeal, an opportunity for you to be baptized November the 1st or November the 8th at this church and said, yeah, I'm not ready to do that because Aunt Harriet's not in town, and I'm not ready to do that because if I do that, I won't be able to sin again. That's evil one. He's telling you all kinds of lies and schemes to keep you from going public with your faith. If you're nothing else I say today, if you're a Christ follower in this room, if you're a Christ follower online, if you are afraid of getting together with people, I will meet you at the river. We've got plans to do it with two people already. But take this step. Go to the app and say, man, I've been disobedient by waiting. How, how can you do the second and the third step when you've not taken the first one? The week I got saved as a child, the very next week we were in church that Sunday night and they came back and they told my father, would you like to be ready to get baptized? And he was like, man, I love the week before all these old ladies were kissing me and telling me they're so glad I came into their family. I never met them. I thought I was coming over for dinner. It was awesome. But, but I, I knew enough as a child to say, I want to do that, Dad. July of 1969. And I'll never forget that day that my daddy baptized me. What if I'd said I want to wait? On October 3rd, 1969, my dad and my brother perished in a plane crash. I'm so glad I took the step. And there's a bunch of you here and out there and everywhere who need to do this. I will baptize you with a mask, mask on, with rubber gloves, with a shield on, with a helmet on. I will get COVID tested the day before or the day of. Get this done, y'all. Take the helmet of salvation. Make sure you got the helmet on. Because when you go to college, you're going to hear a lot of different things if you're a student. When you go get that PhD degree or you go get that training work, ah, oh, we know what this says is right, but this is what we do here. And the sword of the Spirit to take that as well, which is the Word of God. The, the word sword is not one of those big broad swords like William Wallace used to. It's a short sword. It's like a big knife. He says, so, so you can, when you know God's Word and you internalize it in your mind and your heart and your soul, then, then what you do then is that you get your short sword sharpened. So when you're on that business trip and that pretty young thing that's wearing a G string comes and tries to get you to come in her room. You go, nope, I made a decision years ago that I was going to be married to Andrea Hardy. And she might do some surgery on me with a sword if she caught me doing that. <laughs> I might get in trouble when I get home for that. <laughs> Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, eat God's Word. Got my binge Jesus shirt on here. There's a reason why a lot of y'all binge in the wrong stuff. Binge about Jesus. Read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And when you can't get over it, go back and read it again. And say, God, what do you want me to, what, what do you want me to learn? I, I want to be like Jesus. Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Tell the stories of Jesus. Have you read all four biographies of Jesus? Maybe that's the step some of you need to take. Four biographies through four different lenses with many things in common but very different from one another. God wants you to binge Jesus Eat his word. Internalize it inside of your life because you're going to need it to stand against the schemer. He's got a lure that's the color you like and it looks like there's nothing to it except you can go and take it and once he sets the hook and he rips it and you know what it's like, don't you, to know what? Oh, man, I just bit into the wrong thing. So don't do it again. Then pray at all times in all kinds of ways. If I could teach you, as I'm continuing to learn, I'm learning it myself, to, to make your, your, your prayers like breathing. 
When somebody says pray for me, it doesn't mean, all right, I'm going to do that tomorrow morning when I get up at 6 o'clock to have my devotion. Although I usually don't do one of that. Those of you early morning people, I don't usually get a pulse before 7. But when I have devotion, I'll pray. No, it's like if you say pray for me right now, if Evelyn says, I want you to pray for me. I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to stop and say, God, you bless Evelyn. Help her to do what is necessary for her, for her next. Lord, bless Andre. Lord, protect him as he flies with American Airlines. Bring his keys back to the fingers back to the keys. Lord God, please help. I, I pray right then. Stop and then do it. It doesn't mean you got to go, oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder in the Cracker Barrel, I'm not going to pray for my waitress. No, but you can go like I did with Lou last week. I said, hey, Lou, how can we pray for you? She said, I lost my son two weeks ago, and I had to get back to work today. Incidentally, I left her a big old tip, and y'all paid for it. <laughs> pray at all times in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Am I supposed to pray about my test? Yep. Am I supposed to pray about which car I'm going to buy? Yep. Am I supposed to pray about who I'm going to choose to run the country? Yep. Am I supposed to pray about the things that I do today? Yep. Am I supposed to pray about what I eat today? Yep. Am I supposed to pray? Here's why. Because if I can't add Jesus' blessings, if that's a bad way to say it. If I can't begin with Jesus' blessings on my decisions, how in the world can I ask him? To make the rest of my life successful. Here's the next thing. Be attentive and not paranoid. A lot, a lot of times, here's what happens with people. There's evil behind every bush. There's the devil's behind every bush. The devil's trying to trip me up everywhere. He, he is. But here's the deal. You don't be paranoid. You just be para. Paranoid. Noid has the connotation of fear. God says that perfect love is cast out fear. If Christ is at the center of your life, perfect love is cast out that fear. By the way, I just skipped over something I want to do right now. If you have never put the helmet of salvation on your head, right now, if you say, I want to follow Jesus, I want you to bow your heads right now. we got some more messages to tackle. But right now, wherever you are, if you're driving, don't bow your heads. If you're in this room, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes and say, I have never taken this helmet of salvation. I've never put salvation in my life. I've always kept Jesus at arm's length. I want Jesus. I want him now. So here's what you do. You say, dear God, Thank you for sending Jesus to fight the battle of sin for me. I turn and follow him now. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, if you said that prayer, I want you to do something. If you're here, I want you to go to the welcome station after we finish the service in the next seven minutes or so. If you're online, immediately right now, would you text today to the number on the screen? Saying, I've accepted. I'm, I'm following Jesus now. It's not according to my devices. I'm following Jesus now. But be attentive and not paranoid. Listen to this. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. When I'm in line and I'm irritated because somebody um, has brought back 74 things at Ollie's and I can't get my chocolate that I came to buy there on sale, I turn my irritation list and my prayer list. When I pass by people that I know disagree with me because they've let it be known by choices they've made and signs in their yard, and instead of saying, you idiot, I say, dear God, please bless them. There's a way and there's a reason they're making decisions and they're buying this or they're choosing that. Finally, today, watch out and keep perspective. So when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, yes, I'm that old. I know I don't look it. <laughs> Cliff Wilson used to be on this show called Laugh In. And he would say, you better watch out. The devil made me do it. Listen, be alert and of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. I like the way they translate it in the old NIV. Be alert and self-controlled. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same 
kinds of suffering. But I want to take you back to something. I want to tell you just briefly before we quit today how to vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm going to tell you how to vote. Whether you're voting for lunch or whether you're voting for a person in higher office, you filter everything through this. Here's what I've learned about the evil one. The enemy comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, get this, I have come that they might have life and life more abundant. I've studied political science. As a matter of fact, I was a political science major in college. I wanted to be a lawyer, and God wouldn't let me. (laughs) I won the political science award at my university. Everybody else got trophies. I got a dumb book. I'm still bitter about that. It's okay. I have been at different times in my life a Democrat, an Independent, and a Republican, so I hope I have mutually offended everyone. But ladies and gentlemen, the decisions we make must make must be made with life in mind. For me, it's about those that will protect and defend life. Whether before a baby is born or after God has done so by giving us sound effects from a beautiful baby this morning. All the way to the day we die. For me, it begins, it does not end with a decision to vote for people that are for life. Now, I've got more political positions, that, and I'm, I'm, they're, I'm, they're superior to yours. In 2024, I'll tell you who I voted for this year, maybe. But here's the reason I won't. It's because you don't need me to tell you who I'm voting for. You need to ask God to tell you who to vote for. And you need to filter all of your decisions through this. I, I, here's what I will say. I'm looking forward to the day where I don't have to hold my nose to vote. Yeah, I know. Me too. Amen. It's about life. Some of you are going like, well, how am I supposed to vote, Pastor Ray? Well, I'll, through this. I've asked some of our elders to pray about this kind of thing because you read some of these voter guides and stuff like that, and it's like, these people hate this, and you know what? So I, I just want—I've been looking for something to share with people, and if you want it, I think I've found a resource with the help of one of our elders, Casey Idle, and his family, to help you say, "All right, let's filter what each side stands for and does their thing." If, if you still haven't made up your mind, um, I've already voted. Took, waited an hour to get in, get it in the other day, and was happy to do so. It's crazy. You had to fill out an absentee ballot and wait in line to come get it. I looked up at me. He said, "That's a weird signature. That has to be yours." <laughs> Resist him standing firm in the faith. On Friday night, I had dinner. I'm going to close. I'm going to close. And here's why life is so important. I had dinner with Mike Croft, who several years ago, after their first baby Noah was born, he and Sarah, who were members of our church at that time, they live in Florida now, he told me to come to the hospital. They, they had a, a baby who had died at birth, Noah. They would have done anything for him to have life because they were like Jesus. He said, well, Pastor Ray, but um, what about those people who can't afford to have baby? We, we partner with the Crisis Pregnancy Center. I'm just talking about birth now. We, we could also talk about how people are protected, how people are not supposed to put knees on necks. We're supposed to put all those kind of things down there as well. I want to, you, those people can't afford to take care of. So several years ago, the Crisis Pregnancy Center, I went to Ansel Overby, the, the leader of our movement here in town. I said, you know what, Ansel? I'm tired of listening to Christians who are always saying, I'm, I'm for life, but won't do anything about it. So here's what we're going to do. Our church is willing to take a woman who wants to have an abortion, and we will support her from the time that she has conceived that child to the time she has this baby and help her get her hands on her, or get on her feet and that kind of stuff. I said, we'll do it. I said, would you find me one? It's been three years. And he's tried, but he hadn't found anybody yet. Let me ask you, somebody's out there online, if you just found out you are pregnant, we care about life and we care about you. You do not have to bear this on your own. We will help support you with all the other resources of our community better because we're going to put money where our mouth is. And how dare those people that say, I am for life, refuse to open up their wallets to say, I'm not giving to it because i got to make my house payment. 
I'm sorry. You vote with this. This made its way to this. And this way to this. I found a voter guide that I think is good. If you want one, message me on Facebook or whatever. I'll send it to you. It doesn't say awful. It just says what each side says what they're there for. So what? So stay ready. Stay ready. Always be ready. Always be ready. So now what? Take a step with Ready Maker. Some of you need to get on that app or you need to walk by the Walton Station. You know what? I accepted Christ today. You need to tell somebody before you leave here. You need to tell somebody before you log off that you're sitting on your couch or on your exercise bike or whatever. You, I have said yes to Jesus, and I'm taking the next step. For others of you, it's a, I'm going to take a step by being baptized. For others of you, it's a, hey, listen, we're going to do not only this big thing at Halloween, we're going to do this thing that's all about light at Christmas time that is going to be p- pandemic friendly and outside and full of a message of light. And we need people to get out. Out of their seats and get off of their blessed assurance. (laughs) Do something. It's going to take us all to do it. Would you begin praying about what we're going to do at Christmas? Because it's going to take everything we have to be able to pull it off. And everything we don't have that God wants to put in our lives. I want to pray for you. And then I want to show you a video about what we're going to be doing next week. And, um... Again, if you've made a decision to follow Christ today, if you're ready to take that step toward baptism, there are people to discuss that with you. You can go on the app and do it. Take your next step in your journey with Jesus.